Hello and welcome to What the Denmark. Today we are going to look at how Danish culture and identity became what it is today. One thing that becomes apparent when moving to Denmark, to me at least, is the Danes' sense of being members of a small country. This perspective can come to define the worldview of many Danes today. But where does it come from? Denmark used to span a lot of Northern Europe, but a series of failed military campaigns over the centuries have whittled the country down to its current standing. To explore the topic, we spoke with Asa Amdissen, who as a critical historian challenged the notion of Denmark and Scandinavia as a utopia. Asa really challenged some conventional views of Danish culture, and so do brace yourself for some thought-provoking perspectives on Denmark. I thought it'd be fun to start off with a bit of a sense of how big Denmark is or how small it is in terms of population. So, do you know the population of Denmark? It's 5.5 million. Five million. I think it's like, yeah, between five and six. I think if you include no, Greenland and, and Faroe Islands. Uh, yeah, there's some things to keep in mind there. <laughs> yeah. So there are 195 countries in the world. China is the top, the most with you know, over a billion. And I think the Vatican City is number 195. Where's your sense on that list? Where is Denmark? Ooh, out of 195. I think I'd place it on 170. No, it's actually 112. Oh, really? Yeah. There's quite a few countries that are less... That are quite small. Yeah, that, that are smaller than Denmark. So even though Denmark feels like a small country, it can seem quite big. It didn't always used to be this way, was it? Because Denmark used to be this much larger power. So sort of over the Middle Ages, I guess, it was this sprawling power that yeah we were uh, almost uh, can i call us almost a superpower uh, yeah <laughs> we were massive we were very influential in yeah. the world and i think that we still have a lot of pride mm. in regards to that in the past well yeah. curious, you went to danish school when you were a student mm -hmm. did you learn about danish history in this way was it something that was on the curriculum yeah we did we learned about how grand we were uh, we learned about the kings mm -hmm. and a few queens we've had as yeah. well of course yeah mm -hmm. I think that actually the approach to history has changed a lot in recent years in Denmark. And obviously we see that in other parts of the world too. Denmark was obviously the, the focal point instead mm. of thinking about what was the position of other nations. So you see it from your own perspective when you learn history often. Mm. Yeah. I think that has changed a lot now. There's a wider curriculum where you also learn about different cultures and religions to an extent. Coming to this, I was like, there were the Vikings, which mm. was sort of... 900, 800, 900s. And then there was this sort of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. So there was Denmark basically being part of most other Northern European countries and that sort of Christianity coming to the country. And then there was the expansion over the 1500s, 1600s. And then it seems in the mid 1800s or in 1800s, that was a bad period of time for Denmark mm -hmm. in terms of going from being this pretty big superpower, suddenly being chopped down. Yeah. And losing a lot of wars and things. We shrank massively mm. during that time. And I think it's interesting because I think that most Danes are very grateful for what we have today and the identity we have today of mm. tolerance and understanding of making everyone feel that they should have equal opportunities. Mm -hmm. But if we had still been as grand and large mm. <laughs> as we were back then, we'd probably be a very different nation. So we should actually almost be grateful to the Swedes for mm. taking parts of Denmark <laughs> and to Germany because that's made us what we are today. And actually, if you look at the way um, we impact the world, we are still very powerful with the power we have today, which is, you know, education, knowledge with regard to some of the new industries like green energy and so on. Mm. A lot of people, when you travel around the world, they think we are much larger mm. uh, because they meet Danes or they hear about our work in connection with, for example, windmill farms yeah. and stuff like that. They've played with Lego. Yeah, Lego younger. is a yeah. massive company. Maersk, yeah. which is a shipping company and uh, oil and so on. And that also is a, a brand we know across the world. Mm. So I think we have knowledge power. <laughs> yeah, so they often call it a bit soft power, don't they? Uh, of having like cultural influence. And so yeah. I think, you know, for example, people watching Danish TV and then thinking more favorably about Denmark, mm. like that they haven't really gone out and sort of, I don't know, been doing 
or your propaganda or like doing sort of these boots on the ground let's try and convince people that Denmark's a great country but through watching these TV shows people get a sense of oh actually Denmark's quite a nice place or maybe I'd want to go and visit maybe I'd want to go and live there Mm. so should we go back then to this point of the dawn of Danish identity which seems to be around this period of the 1800s I'll just hear what Asser has to say. From the defeat in 1864. The defeat against the Germans. Germans. We decided that we could easily beat the Prussian army in 1864. We had approximately 50,000 soldiers at that time. They had approximately five to seven millions. So uh, we couldn't. And uh, afterwards, we had to change our identity. Until then, Danish nationalism was based on Vikings and the glorious past of the Danish Empire and things like that. But the identity as warriors... It was really completely impossible to maintain after the defeat in 1860. We were just, we weren't just beaten. We were just completely wiped out. And the only reason we survived the war was basically because Britain didn't want Prussia to, to take it all. So we had to reinvent our own identity. And then we decided that we were a little bit more democratic. We were a little more tolerant, humane and intelligent than the rest of the world. And of course, we also have been barbarians once, but we mm-hmm. passed through it. And now we are this tolerant human society. And I find it completely interesting that this has nothing to do with our history. The legends of our history, yes, but not our real history. And it has nothing to do with the way Denmark as a country actually do behave. But that's how we see ourselves. And we will maintain it at any cost. That's and, and that's a, a, mm. So the small state narrative is actually a construction that we made to have a national identity when we couldn't have the one we really wanted, the one with the big Vikings and the big red beards and axes and stuff, which we weren't able to maintain. This idea that you can invent a national identity, I've never really thought of it being such a conscious thing. I've never really thought about where, for example, like British values or British legends come from. It's just sort of assumed that they're always there. This idea that in Denmark, there was this moment where people came together and they said, we tell ourselves that we're these big Viking warriors and we've just been absolutely decimated. We cannot maintain that image. So what are we going to be? And this sort of moment of self-reflection of saying, who are we as a people? We're going to come together. What are the values that we want to have? I think that's a fascinating moment in history to sort of been in Denmark at that time. A bit like the um, Declaration of Independence in America, where people came together and they said, what do we want our society to look like? I think what an amazing moment to sort of have that vision and then to actually you know, put it into paper and, and try and make it happen. Yeah, and, and you make it sound very organized in that yeah. way. I, I don't think it would have been, but I think that in, in a way it's probably just been a common uh, survival mechanism. Mm. So you need to recreate your identity mm. and that's the only way that you can move forward in a situation like mm. that. So that's probably what happened, that first you need to deal with the huge losses you've had mm. and the horror of the war you've been through. And then obviously also there's some pride mm-hmm. <laughs> that's probably been injured a fair bit. But after that, the survival instinct kicks in. Yeah, because I think this idea that Denmark, these values are very collaborative And a lot of, I think, of the things that are unique and special about Denmark sort of come from this moment of cooperation. And when you've been wiped out by a war, you can't just live on your own and just try and live individualistically. You need to find these, you know, build these systems, build these ways of coming to together to support each other in a way that doesn't lead to bad outcomes, you know, big inequalities, mm. etc. So you're right, yeah, maybe maybe it was less... Organize, Plan, organize yeah, it and more just yeah. like, oh, this is a response, but we're going to make sure that because we've had these pasts where there have been people who've, there have been concentrations of power, we want to do things in a way where that is more egalitarian. There yeah. must obviously have been a, a national pride and psyche that remained mm. because you kind of need that in order to move yeah. into the next chapter Definitely. Oh, after this. There is something, oh my gosh, <laughs> which is really funny. Um, have you heard about the Danish protest pig. No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is fantastic. So this is a, the Husum Rul Peel. The Danish protest pig was basically a bunch of Danish people came together and they bred this pig to have a particular 
fur mm -hmm. that had the Danish flag on it. And that uh -huh. was their way of saying, even though we are being told that we are in Prussia, we're still really Danes and we're so wow. Danish that we're going to have these pigs that have our national flag on them. That's like I think that's pretty uh, <laughs> impressive that you'd actually go to uh, that much effort yeah. in order to show your protest and also show your nationhood and where exactly. you belong. Exactly. I mean, so you have obviously this patriotism mm. has been extremely strong in people if they would do exactly this. Yeah. And I mean, I think it is interesting just to remember how big Denmark was because we had large parts of northern Germany. Mm. We had Norway and we had the whole of southern Sweden. Yeah. And obviously, suddenly losing so much is of about, that. Did it go down to about a quarter of the size? Less than a quarter of the size really? because Norway is massive. Yeah. Obviously, if you think geographically, yeah, yeah. in terms of population, I'm not sure. And I'm actually interested in fact, I mean, it's it would be interesting to know how many people I, traveled back I was trying to, to Denmark. I was trying to search this. I, I couldn't find an easy way of, of getting an answer yes. from Google. So it, it would almost be like, the whole of the United States of America suddenly reducing down to Oregon and California. Yeah, can you imagine? And, and then that's those people who are left in Oregon and California are the last remaining Americans. Correct. And there's all that other stuff. And suddenly the rest would be some entirely different yeah. nation. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had England as well, you know, meddling. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, there's uh, some uh, horrible historical situations for Denmark fighting England and terrible losses out near Helsingør or yeah. Elsinore. Yeah. So yeah, we would have looked very different if mm. things had not turned out the way they did. And then we had to remodel our national identity. And that's where the tolerance, the humanity, the democracy, they're seen as opposition to Prussians. We all know the myth about with their, they have all those papers and bureaucracy and hierarchy. That's who the Russians were. They have emperors and stuff like that. And we were trying to be the opposite. So when if they had hierarchy, we had a flat structure. That's how mm. we Danes are. If they had bureaucracy, we had flexibility. If they were strict, then we were tolerant. If they were autocratic, then we were democratic. And basically, that is a dichotomy that creates the Danish national identity. Mm. And the interesting part is that we are repeating that national, those mythology in the late 19th century. We are repeating with an intensity so high that it actually ends up being true. It's interesting, isn't it? Like this idea that a lot of these values were partly we're going to come together to survive. But I do like this sort of quite petulant. It's almost like you're in a plate on the playground. You'd be like, if the Prussians are this, we're going to be this. And this sort of way of being anti Prussian, almost like quite a good guiding principle. Yeah, I totally agree. And I just think that's uh, also a way of defining yourself. It's mm. by basically making yourself stand out. And you do that by going in the opposite direction, mm. don't you? And I think this other interesting point that came from it was like maybe it wasn't so organized but we sort of start saying okay well this is what denmark is these are the values and then even though it's just been invented the more you say it it soon starts to be true mm. and this idea of like the power of having these stories and narratives of like we are a tolerant nation we have flat hierarchies we do these things we do these things mm. and soon it just starts to happen and actually begins to live up to everything that's being said yeah, but I do think that also, I mean, it's happened over a hundred years at least. Mm. I don't think it happened sort of within the first 20 years even. I do mean, I you know, I don't think it's been that fast. Okay. I think it slowly evolved mm. over time. And even if you think about, if you're looking at the 20th century, that's also been progressing in that direction. So you're right in terms of the direction it's been taking. Mm. So we've been taking that direction towards a flatter hierarchy in Denmark. So if you look back a hundred years, there would not be as flat hierarchies as you have today, for example. Oh, really? Mm. Do you reckon? Okay. In my head, it's, I've always got it as Denmark was basically like any other European country in the 1600s. You've got kings, lords, aristocracy, and then peasants. Mm. And then this sort of 1860s thing happens in Denmark and suddenly mm. it's like, oh, actually, one of the kings says... I'm going to basically step down and allow people to, to organize themselves. Mm. And then the people have said, right, okay, we're going to do things differently. We're going to make sure that we do this in a fair democratic way. And I imagine in my head, I always had it as like, okay, well, there's going to be a few years, but we'll, we'll get it. And then suddenly people can live affordably. They can, as you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it peaks at the welfare states. 
maybe that's the exactly. So yeah. if you, for example, look, a lot happened during the 60s. Mm. A lot happened, obviously. Also, you know, if you think about when were women given the right to vote? Yeah, okay, um, I point. mean, that's yeah. also about you know flat hierarchies and equal rights and so on. And that was first in the start of the 20th century. Yeah, so it was like you know, 60 years. Yeah. So years after, yeah. yeah. So I mean, so there has been a steady progress towards mm. the flat societal structure we have today mm. but you know if you look back there's still been a lot of hierarchies and similar structures to what you've seen in other countries just less extreme and more with a focus on the common person mm. and trying to create a better situation for mm. the poor man woman yeah. and allowing that part of society to, to organize themselves better yeah I think it's curious that, you know, in, in 50 to 100 years time, they may look back at the 2020s and be like, it was still so hierarchical. Mm. You know, women weren't in positions of power in business and politics. Uh, yeah, it was you know, only the women who took the maternity leave. Yeah, um, or there was, there men was, hardly ever did that. <laughs> yeah, or um, ethnic minorities were in no positions of power. Like, how can we say that it was a flat hierarchy when it's only for these sorts of people? So it's interesting how, like, even though we can right now feel like, oh, we're on this path, it might be that we're still, we're definitely not there yet. Mm. And but and I think again, what's really interesting is that we are working towards the direction of equal opportunities, equal rights. So the path and the direction for the path was potentially set back then, mm. but we are still walking the path towards yeah. a goal. Now, one thing that Asa was particularly challenging of, which I must say it was so interesting just to sort of hear someone who challenges this view of we have these stories, we have these narratives, but what's it actually like in reality? Mm. He himself said how he is being deliberately provocative, but I sometimes it can be still useful to sort of get you thinking about these things. So. Mm. One of the questions that he seemed to ask is, that, is Danish identity a sham? Basically, Denmark is a country who thinks that we are the best country in the world. And we have a lot of uh, ideology who uh, creates the definition of who we are. Tolerance is one good example. We say we are the most tolerant country in the world. And even though that the Danish immigration policy probably is the toughest in the world, make Donald Trump blush if he had to go through these, and that's kind of difficult to make him do that, I think. Uh, 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 we still claim we are still the most tolerant country. And if you say something else to a Danish politician, they are getting really mad at you because you can't claim that we are a democratic country, the most democratic country in the world. But only 3% of the Danish population is a member of a political party and only a small part of them is actually active in the parties. So every time I go to vote, then I can only vote to the people that this tiny minority has decided that I can vote on in order to be there. So how much a democracy we are, how much we are oligarchy, that's a definite question of definition. But we claim to be the biggest. We are welfare state, the most fair welfare state, but the least distance between the richest and the poorest. And it's true. I'm the CEO of a company and I don't earn probably a twice as much as the, the salary of the lowest, the person who got the least money out of, of the company. So it's not very much. If you look in a UK or a US company, it will be probably 10 or 30 times. But it's also because that the working class, the working poor has been exported. My favorite example is socks. It's a, a really good example. In, in, in the 17th century, when you needed some socks, you went to some poor farmers who didn't have any land and they were knitting socks themselves. And then you can buy your, your own socks. And this, that was the per, working poor. It came industrialization. They, we got uh, factories, machines imported from Great Britain. And then, then we had a working class and they went and made the socks in these machines. I'm not very good at machines, but they were probably noisy and efficient. And then we had a working class. Today, we have exported the working class. We have, through the unions and through the welfare state, we have made it so expensive that you can't produce socks in Denmark. Instead, we use child workers in Bangladesh or in China who make the socks for us and sell them to us. Do that mean that there's no difference between the richest and the poor in our society? Or just as, does, does it just mean that we have exported the poor people from the society and made sure that they live in Bangladesh where we don't have to look at them? And then we are just middle class in Denmark. You might say that we have made a virtue of globalization. That's also part of the story of the welfare state. The pr products we use is not 
really made in Denmark. They are made in the rest of the world. And that means that capitalism has been able to diversify not the means of production, but where people live when they produce these things. And it's all examples of that we have an identity being tolerant, democratic, humane, which is core value to Danish people. We will be very aggressive if we are challenged on that, but it hasn't really anything to do with... Well, you might say that if we are seen as a nation, we are... I don't think liars is the right word, but we are a, a nation who has a very strong feeling of self without really having any basis for it. You're saying we're hypocrites to an extent. <laughs> yeah, actually. I think hypocrites is a very good. I think that hypocrisy is basically a part mm. of core Danish values. He's obviously talking about Denmark, but he's talking about any capitalist country in the world. Mm. And yes, I suppose that you could say that to an extent maybe Danes are more hypocritical than many others in that we celebrate the fact that we have a welfare state where we treat everyone as we see as equal as mm. possible. And therefore, the hypocrisy, you could say, is even bigger because we are claiming that we are tolerant and that we yeah. behave decently, whereas others, they might not celebrate that as much as we would do. Yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's this idea of... Um, you know, one of the by most measures inequality is you know what's the difference between the highest and the lowest earners and this idea that all of denmark is basically middle class mm. or upper class there is no working class because all the workers are in other parts of the world if you look at it just draw a circle around denmark and you're like okay well within this country people do have a low level of inequality but then i think as soon as you zoom out and you look at things on a global perspective you're like, oh, okay, well, actually, Denmark is part of something which is where well, there is lots of inequality because the thing, the products that are being enjoyed in Denmark are just being produced in other parts of the world. Yeah, we're one small piece of the puzzle, aren't we? Which mm. is the global puzzle. Mm-hmm. And because we're also interconnected now, obviously, you could argue, as uh, Asa is arguing, you could argue that basically our working class poor that we say we don't have are the ones that could be child labor in China, for example. I do think that Denmark is working very hard to look at supply chains Mm. and to look at the conditions that people work under from the places we import goods from. So I think that we make an effort. But I mean, he's totally right that, of course, I mean, any capitalist society that buys products, uh, goods from poor countries where human rights are not always obeyed, are guilty to an extent and cannot call themselves a fair society. Mm. But I think one thing we can then say that we also do trying to improve the situation in different parts of the world is through development aid. We are one of the countries in the world that invest the most development aid in poor countries Mm. per capita. So we actually make a big effort to have a positive impact. Yeah, and I think as well, as an internet well i suppose you are a citizen of the world as well with a lot of these issues i'm like if denmark can't sort it out what hope have the rest of us got denmark really can become this sort of guiding principle like the with the um i think when we're going to be doing a a whole episode on the green transition but denmark's approach to say we're going to take the hard path and we're going to say no more oil if denmark was to not do that then every other country in the world would be like well even up in Denmark, where everyone has got all their basic needs covered, even they are still continuing to use oil. So why on earth should we cut back on our coal mines and all those sorts of things? So it can be really good for from a global perspective to see Denmark and I guess you know, any country that takes these sort of hard steps to sort of show others that it is possible when they're in a position to do so. And leading the way. And mm. you can only lead the way in those areas because you have the whole nation supporting that Mm. and you know also not expecting to be exceptionally rich because Mm. it's very difficult to be exceptionally (laughs) rich in Denmark because you pay so much tax Mm. so you have to believe in something bigger if listening to this episode has made you think gosh I'd love to spend some time living in a small country for a change then you might be in luck Denmark needs international people to move here and work. Being a small country, there's only so much tech and other talent that's available, and lots of aspiring Danish companies are actively trying to hire internationals. 
These companies typically work in English, often are doing something interesting, and working for them means you get to live in one of the happiest countries in the world. If listening to What the Denmark has piqued your interest in the country, then go check out the State of Denmark's website. There you can sign up to job alerts from Danish companies looking for internationals and read more about what your everyday life in Denmark could be like. Head to www.state-of-denmark.com forward slash WDD. I'll also link to that in the show notes. Now, back to the show. What's your thought on are Danes the most modest people in the world? I don't know, actually. I suppose I might be too Danish to see it. Yeah. I can't see the the woods for trees. Mm. Um, so you tell me, Sam, are we the most modest people in the world? Well, I definitely, again, oh, it's always it's always difficult territory here talking about the whole of Denmark when I've mm. got sort of a handful of Danish people who I speak to on a regular basis. But I do feel that there is a sense of satisfaction when someone is complimented for a lovely candlestick holder or a lovely lamp. And I think people do really like to invest in things that in sort of aesthetic beauty. So I think there is a, a sense of Danes will typically have fewer higher quality items of clothing than in other parts, places I've been to. There's a real sense of being house proud in terms of the things that you have within your apartment. And I guess there will be some innate joy or value taken from just things looking nice. But I do feel that there is there is a sense of needing to, if not impress other people, then not unimpress them. Yeah, I think there is to an extent. Now you mentioned like the way we, I mean, we're house proud. Um, I think you're right. I mean, there's something about Danish design. Mm. We think that we have better taste than the rest of the world, mm-hmm. that we know what looks good. And then we, to an extent, and this is not necessarily a mean way, but we, to an extent, we, I suppose we do look down on other nations for not being able to dress as elegantly as us or dress their houses as elegantly as us. But the interesting thing is that we are actually celebrated as such by the rest of the world. So maybe we have reason to be proud, though we shouldn't say that. That's not modest. Yeah. <laughs> so I should, I'm, I'm not behaving in a Danish way right now by saying that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, Danes definitely are modest by normal standards, I think, in situations where other people would speak outwardly about their success. Yeah, we we are extremely proud, yeah. but we don't. We would never mention that. So yeah. we, we're very proud of our achievements and think that we are very special. Mm-hmm. We would just never say it. And in many ways, we have made great achievements considering what a small nation we are. Mm. We're talking about knowledge, power and so on. We would never say that. And that's about the modesty. But mm. a lot of people, one thing is what you say. Another thing is how you feel. Because mm. my sense is on a lot of things, things for quite good reason do think, yeah, we're really good at this. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And we are. I mean, we have achieved a lot. So mm. there is a lot to celebrate. But I also think that one thing is that we would be very modest about it. But I think we do feel pride in a lot of our achievements and in where we are as a society. But I also think that when they're not doing well, we almost find it embarrassing mm. because we actually feel that we should be better than that. To an extent, like any other nation or a society, we are blind to some of the issues mm. we have. But when faced with them, I also think that we have this desire to uh, achieve in that area as well. Actually, I mean, that's a lot of what As has been talking about as well. Basically, I do think that we in Denmark do things a little bit better than in most countries. I just don't think we're doing it as good as we claim to do it. I know that we in Denmark actually pay more to the third world than you do, you do in, in, in other countries, even though I don't think the way we do it is very elegant, but that's a different question. But we do that. But the basic point is we believe that we give a lot of our wealth, but we don't. There is more equality in Denmark and there's more feeling of community in there than there is in, in many other countries. But basically, we have this thing that's saying that if something is Danish, that we have this coherence. And that means that if we uh, we call on that, then criticism is mo- impossible. Then we cannot see our own faults because we are the best place in the world. We are the happiest people. And you're probably right. It's not as bad as I painted, but it is a lot worse than we usually claim it to be. As his main point being that there's this slight yeah, gap between 
the narrative of Danish identity and what he sees as the reality. And I think his main force with all of this is to sort of say that there is a gap. It's not, you know, the narrative and reality is not equally aligned. So even though it might be in this, you know, in this, in the right direction, be aware or just be conscious that there are these differences. Yeah. And I think we should be, and I think all nations, all people should, because mm. that's always the case anywhere. Yeah. No, knowing that there is this difference between the narrative and what's going on. Yeah. And the perception and what's a real case, basically. Mm. Um, yeah. Did you learn about the Vikings when you were at school? I did learn about the Vikings, but not very much. I actually spent more time learning about the Vikings as part of my upbringing, going to museums with mm. my family. Yeah. And um, potentially also with, you know, you have these school aftercare clubs and stuff like that. So yeah. there's always been a big celebration of the Vikings and focus on that theme. But mm. I don't think it's takes up a lot of space in your history classes, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Because I thought this, this point which Asa made about... Um, it basically being a 19th century construct or again it, it before a certain point it wasn't there weren't mm. wasn't really spoken about and it sort of fits this purpose. it's a narrative reclaimed yeah. basically and it's sort of like oh we need this talk <clears throat> of a glorious past where we were warriors we can't say that now because the prussians have just beaten us but way back when we were this amazing seafaring warrior nation and just the idea that it was kind of made up not made up, but it was used, celebrated. used for that purpose yeah. as opposed to just, but then I guess you start getting into it and everything, all these historical stories are there yeah. for a purpose at the time. And I suppose if you look to ancient Greece, they celebrate their history mm. and, you know, it looks very different than what we can show here in Denmark, but we celebrate what we do have, which is the Runa and the... Yeah old rocks that the Vikings used to write into and whatever we can find out about that. And yeah. uh, we celebrate that because we find it fascinating. And then obviously this whole idea that there was a people living in Denmark and across the Nordics um, that were seafarers and mm -hmm. could build something so incredible that it could take you all the way to America yeah. and of anyone else. That is, I understand that that's an mm -hmm. exciting thing to celebrate and, it's the thing we can celebrate from our past. That, that's a recipe for nationalism, which was generally used all over Europe. But in Denmark, we had the problem that we need to have a glorious past. That's also part. In Great Britain, it was King Arthur legends that was rewritten. In Scotland, it was uh, the Highlander myth uh, that was uh, being told. French were looking at Charlemagne, the Italians were looking at Romans, and so on and so forth. And in Denmark, we were looking back in our history to say, how, when was we glorious? That's when they invented the Vikings. Mm. That is when we say this Viking thing, that's who we really are. And then we said, in reality, we are Vikings. There is a Danish legend that is so important for understanding how nationalism was in the early 19th century. And it's the myth of Holger Danske. Roger Le Danois was his original name. Roger Le Danois was, in, according to legend, he was a Danish, was a Danish king, and his, he was son of that, that king. And then he was taken as a hostage by Charlemagne. We are back in 800 after Christ or something like that. And he he became a great hero and stopped the Muslims and did a lot of things. And then he got old and got back to Denmark, and then he he was buried. But it is said that when Denmark is really threatened, then he will return and fight down our enemies. The mythology of that, the concept is that that is who we are. That's early 19th century Danish nationalism. In reality, we are warriors. Most mm. of us Danish men, we could easily have a Viking within our bellies. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. all the yeah. tolerance, and, and, modesty, yeah, and, and all and of that. Yeah, but they haven't spirit. thought of that yet. But <laughs> we were modern people, but really <laughs> under pressure, then we would be able to do this. In typical... Danish modesty, the Vikings aren't the ones who are known as discovering America. It's the Portuguese. <laughs> so, so they, they did it like 600 years earlier, but they were like, oh, we can't talk about it. So it's ourselves. Yes, yeah. we are very modest in that way. Yeah. But at the same time, we all know it. Yep. All know it, just can't, couldn't possibly say it. It's up we didn't to, really it's, have a flag that we could plant. No, it's up to an English person to come in and point it out to the Danes <laughs> and say, well done. <laughs> That was really interesting to dive into uh, the Danish history. It was, and this, this idea of the Danish identity, where it's come from. Yeah, and the fact that, I think it's interesting, I don't think a lot of people know that Denmark really used to be a 
massive powerhouse yeah. until we had our big military losses and we lost what would now be Norway, southern Sweden and northern Germany. Yeah, and that really sort of set the scene for the forging of Danish values that we see today. Exactly, and I'm so grateful that happened because I'm very proud of yeah. what we uh, can uh, show off to the world now. Yeah. Who wants to be a massive country anyway? Yeah, yeah, if you can change the world and make it greener by being small. Yes, very good. Thanks, as always, to Andreas Gröning for producing and Tevin Sudi for editing the show. You can read more about ASA in the links in the show notes and also follow What the Denmark via our website, whatthedenmark.com, and on Facebook and Instagram by searching for What the Denmark. Vi ses næste gang. Vi ses. Yeah, it's an over-indexed of uh, of murder, <laughs> murders on Danish TV. Probably so because there's so little of it here, so we have to use our imagination to uh, create <laughs> something exciting. Yeah.